You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you all doing? I am filled with the lurgy of the day. So forgive me if I sound a bit chesty, coffee, raspy, but you've got me and I'm here and that's something. What a week it's been. Went to see a production of Noughts and Crosses at my daughter's school. It was it was just incredible to see it. But at the end, I felt so compelled. I wanted to stand up and do a standing ovation because I just thought it was excellent. And I turned, I was on the front row because my daughter had said that's where I had to sit. Fine. I always do what my daughter tells me to do. And I just turned behind me and there were a couple of people on one side standing up. But nobody else was standing. And being British, I thought, oh, no, don't want to obscure everyone's vision behind me. So I'll stay sitting. Literally 30 seconds later, I don't know why, I just looked behind again. And we were the only people not standing. And there's my daughter there with a mother who she made sit on the front row not standing. So I immediately sort of leapt up and did this over the top clapping. I was just like, oh, no. Why is this always happening to me? I don't understand. But yes, so that was a lot of fun, but we got through it. Now, let me tell you about the books we're looking at today, because my goodness, we've got some absolute crackers for you. So the first one is The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz. I think, yes, um, author retreat, sort of closed in area, thrillery, and much more. Very good. And Julia is going to come on and talk to us about that book. Then we've got Paris Requiem by Chris Lloyd. Think 1940s, Paris, crime solving, police. Yeah, all, all very good. And Chris is going to come on and talk to us about that book. Then also I'm going to review Mad Honey by Jodie Pickle and Jennifer Finney Boylan. Now that, how to describe that? There's a, a court case in it and it's about it's about all sorts of things more of which I'll tell you then we've got no oh, listen to this one let me just pull it out the red notebook by Antoine Laurent and that book is about well it's about a lost handbag and a found connection I don't say any much more about that and finally her sweet revenge by sarah bonner which is a psychological thriller and we've got a call in from johan so that's very exciting thank you so much johan for calling in and what a feedback we had from last week with the question that someone had put in was it someone wanted to be called m i think it was and all the responses had some lovely feedback about that and about the interview with tina and drew so thank you so much for that that's just great We need to get started, don't we? And start we shall. So first book, The Writing Retreat, Julia Bartz. Now, I saw the cover of this book and thought, oh, The Writing Retreat, that sounds interesting. Then I was watching someone who um, is a booktuber, so they make videos on YouTube about the books that they read. And the one I was really watching, she is based in America and she reads every thriller on the planet. And she was saying how she'd got her most anticipated books to read and she was going to read them and see what she thought and every book she was like oh I don't like it I don't like it and then she got to this one I thought oh please like it and she didn't just like it she loved it she was raving about it so I thought yes thank you so let me read you the blurb on this one Five attendees are selected for a month-long writing retreat at the remote estate of Rosa Vallo, the controversial high priestess of feminist horror. Alex, a struggling writer, is thrilled. Upon arrival, they discover they must complete an entire novel from scratch and the best one will receive a seven-figure publishing deal. Alex's long-extinguished dream is now within reach. But then the women begin to die. Trapped, terrified, yet still desperately writing, it is clear there's more than a publishing deal at stake at Blackbriar Estate. Alex must confront her own demons and finish her novel to survive. So let's go to Julia to read us one of the first sentences now. My phone rang, a tinny guitar riff that made me grit my teeth. I rolled over in bed and groaned. I had a headache, the type that felt like hot metal spikes through my skull. I silenced the ringtone, noting the string of text messages from Pete. 3 a.m. Let me know you got home safe. 4 a.m. Alex, you okay? 7 a.m. 
Please call me when you see this. I'm serious. Well, excellent. I can't wait to talk to Julia about this book, but I just have to say, yeah, I absolutely loved it. It kept me gripped. There were times that it was sort of inspiring me to write and other times it definitely didn't. I loved the the route it took. I enjoyed the story. I thought it was different, fresh. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Really, really liked it. So let's go and talk to Julia now. Well, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast Julia Bartz, whose fabulous book is called The Writing Retreat. Julia, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. It's really good to talk to you. We need to talk about this book. Let's start with the absolute basics. Can you give us a bit of a summary of this story? Sure. So this book is about a woman named Alex who has pretty much given up on her dreams of becoming a published author when she gets the once in a lifetime opportunity to attend a writing retreat at the home of her favorite author, the horror novelist, Rosa Vallo. So Alex, you know, shows up, she's very excited about this retreat, but she finds out when she gets there that it's also a writing contest. So Rosa is asking all the attendees to write an entire book from scratch over the month of February, and she will give her favorites a $1 million book deal. So Alex really buckles down, she gets into her novel, but soon she starts noticing like strange things happening around Rosa's estate. And when one of the other attendees goes missing, Alex has to figure out what's really happening at Rosa's writing <laughs> retreat, or she may disappear too. Because I started off reading it and I was quite inspired. I thought, oh, this sounds like a really good retreat and, and a great way to get a book yes. done. And then you think, oh, Maybe not for me, no. So where did you get the idea for this book? So I had to really go back through my files because I have been working on it in many, you know, different iterations for a long time. And I finally got to the first, the very first draft. And I realized, and I had forgotten this, that it was actually a NaNoWriMo book. Oh, wow. So for anyone who doesn't know, NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month. And so this was way back in late 2014, I decided to do NaNoWriMo with some friends. And um, I think I was the only one that actually finished. (laughs) Um, It was not easy, but that's where the characters came from. Alex, Ren, Rosa. It was a very different um, type of book. It was actually verging into sci-fi territory. (laughs) Rosa was an alien. There was, yeah, there was a lot going on. But yeah, there's something about those three characters that really stuck with me. And even though the story wasn't working, um, I kind of held on to the idea. And years later, I, I literally remember where I was. I was having lunch outside and the idea of setting it at a writing retreat came to me and everything kind of fell into place. Now, the problem was that I had written two books before this that I was not able to get published despite my best efforts. And I really wasn't sure if I could do it a third time and and have kind of the same thing happen. So I decided that if I wanted to write this book, I really had to focus on the process instead of the outcome. And I decided to use it as a way to explore actually this idea of, of being a frustrated or even failed writer. And so I was able to to really dig into that as the theme of the book. But that takes some conviction to keep going, even though you've had two books not taken up. I mean, I gave up after one book. So I, I really admire your resilience. Oh, thank you. I mean, I've it's so interesting talking to people because it's not uncommon that people write multiple books before um, they have one that is published and For me, it took, you know, many years. I think it was like 15 plus years to get to this point. So, yeah, there has to be a way to to enjoy it. Otherwise, you know, it's just going to be really disheartening. Mm. So you ended up writing this book for you, really, rather than to get it sold. Exactly. Yes. And I was also in the process of becoming a therapist. So I was changing careers because for so long, my idea had just been, oh, I want to be a writer. So I had like a day job, but I was really focusing on the writing. And then when it didn't work out, I went through this period of depression and I started therapy for the first time. 
think this was in my early 30s, and I loved it. I really connected with my therapist and was able to find out a lot about myself that I wasn't aware of, you know, my patterns, et cetera. And so I decided if the writing wasn't going to work out, I need to, to figure out a plan B. So I went back to school for clinical social work and I'm doing that now, still seeing clients and, and loving it. But when I was writing this book, I also decided to, in addition to explore this idea of failing artistically, also just going as kind of dark and disturbing, like really going into those dark corners of my brain <laughs> and explore, you know, things that are people may not see as as like nice or appropriate. They're actually called shadow parts, like parts of ourselves that we repress early on because we're told that they're not acceptable. And for girls and women, that often has to do with um, aggression, sexuality, um, envy, jealousy. And so I, I also wanted to use this book to explore all those things. So that was quite fun. Wow. And I love the female group of characters, such different ones. Did it take you a while to sort them out in your mind so you knew who they were going to be? So I started with Alex and Ren. So again, Alex is the main character and then Ren is her kind of ex-best friend. They were close for, for many years. Roommates had, you know, maybe to an unhealthy degree, you know, a bit of a codependent relationship. And then something happens where their friendship ends. So that that dynamic was always there from the very beginning. And Rosa was also there from the beginning. And then the other characters came later because obviously there had to be other attendees at this writing retreat. And it was really fun to kind of explore who they were. And I mean, when I started writing about them, I wasn't sure like what was actually happening with each of them. Some of them are, you know, hiding things about themselves that you find out later on in the book. And so that 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 process was enjoyable to get to know them. And the book for me, yes, it's about women and about writing, but I felt it was just about power. Was that something that you wanted to explore, or just came as the story mm -hmm. was being written? Yes, power was a major theme of the book. And I think that it, for me, came from feeling powerless in my kind of creative life. It was actually really helpful for me to go back to grad school and take all these classes and really start thinking about um, systemic barriers and, and issues that people have. And kind of the deeper you go into that, the more you realize that all these things that we feel like shame about or like uh, we failed or we did something wrong, the more you kind of go outside of that, you see that uh, like these are very common things that people feel oftentimes because of just how society is set up. So for creative people, like it's very difficult to be a paid artist in American society nowadays. I mean, I'm still not a full-time writer. So that was something again, that I think a lot of writers and artists feel, but it's hard to talk about it. And oftentimes we take it as a personal failing, like, oh, I didn't make it, or um, I didn't get published, or I didn't get the grant, or whatever the case may be, but it's extremely competitive, and even more so for people from marginalized communities. Mm. I mean, the book really gripped me as I was reading it. Did it grip you as you were writing it? It was really fun to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love suspense. I love horror movies. I love thrillers. I love, you know, that feeling of, of racing through a book, like needing to know what happens next. So I really wanted to include that in, in the writing retreat. And to do so, I actually structured this book more than I had with my, my other two books, because I really wanted there to be a lot of tension. I wanted there to be a lot of kind of twists and turns. And so coming up with all that was, was quite fun. So do you have post-it notes on a wall or are you writing it down? What's your approach? I had a huge bulletin board. So it was literally post-its and like little pieces of paper. I broke it up into the four different um, like parts. And yeah, I don't think I came up with the whole plot at the beginning, but definitely 
at least up until the midpoint, I knew what was going to happen. It felt a very visual book to me. And I was wondering if you were visualizing it as you were writing and if there's going to be a film made of it. Yeah, I mean, writing is so interesting. And I, I was trying to go into this in the book itself to kind of share with people who may not be writers what the writing process feels like. I know that you said that you've written before, so you've I'm sure that you've experienced this, but you know, Alex kind of um, refers to it as it feels like you're channeling something. And that is really how it feels oftentimes. You know, when you're writing a scene, you're just kind of watching it play out in your mind and you're recording it, and it can be quite eerie sometimes. You know, sometimes the characters will do or say something that you weren't as the writer expecting. That's really a cool feeling. I think I I at least for me, when I write, I do things, I do see things visually playing out and just try to capture as much as possible. And will we see a film? <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, great. Because yeah. it, it would work so well. Mm, I know. I would be, I would be really excited to see it on screen. We'll watch this space then. So how and where do you write? Do you have a set play? So for this book, I was working full time. I was also, yeah, I was in grad school and then post-grad school kind of doing training. And so I knew that if I didn't do it first thing in the morning, I probably wouldn't be able to get back to it during the day. And that was the same for my first two books too. I would get up early and write in bed for an hour or two. And I think that's actually helpful because your mind feels a little bit more clear, like you're not thinking about everything that you have to do that day. And there's also maybe kind of like a liminal space between waking up mm. and then like going out, you know, and doing everything you need to do that makes it sometimes easier to access um, maybe unconscious or subconscious elements that you're bringing into your story. With those two books, are you inclined to go back now and do something with them or are you just using that as a stepping stone? Well, the last book was actually a near future novel in which Roe v. Wade has been overturned. Oh, wow. So I really wasn't expecting it to happen IRL so quickly. Yes. <laughs> and it's funny because, you know, back then some people who, you know, I was speaking with agents, I was, you know, connecting with editors and agents and trying to find representation and some people thought that it was not realistic enough <gasps> and so that yeah I mean that's that's I think done <laughs> what happened you know in real life was much more disturbing than than my story and then the first novel was a it was a novel in stories because I had never written a novel so I thought maybe writing a novel in stories will be kind of a way to trick myself <laughs> into <laughs> writing something longer. I I did like it. I I would have to go back. I haven't reread it in many years, so I'm not sure how I would feel about it. It feels like such a different version of me that wrote it too, so I'm not sure if if that's something that I would still feel as connected to, but who knows. Are you working on something now? I am working on my next book and feeling excited about it. It's There's a lot of crossover with the writing retreat. So I think if people like the writing retreat, hopefully they will like this book too. And uh, one of the major themes is just how our reality is so dependent on the people around us, even to sometimes a horrifying degree. And your book has been published in the States. It's now been published in the UK and various other places. Does it differ according to the region? Obviously, the cover's different, but is there... Is the process the same for you as the author? It is. I mean, it's it's the same book. Um, there weren't really any changes that we made for the UK version. And the response has been pretty similar, too. I think people either connect to it or they don't. <laughs> so that's that's been fun. There was just a read-along that was happening on Instagram. So people were sharing their thoughts at different points while reading the book and what they thought would happen and, and how they responded to different twists and turns. And that was that was really cool to follow along with that. Oh, I'm sure. Is the publication of your book, you know, you've waited so long to have a book published. Is it what you thought it would be? I think that until you go through the publication process, you can't really know what to expect. And I have, you know, friends who have been published. My sister is a New York Times bestseller. So I've definitely um, kind of see, 
I've seen them going through the process. For me, I think the hardest part was I had a pretty intense fear of public speaking. And so that aspect of it in the past was something that I always, you know, even when I was fantasizing about getting published, it would just bring up this dread. Like I have to, you know, speak to people or be in front of people. And luckily I found an amazing speech coach and she's also a somatic therapist and I was working with her. It was really interesting to dig into those fears and this fear of being seen um, or this fear of being exposed. And I think when you're a writer, oftentimes you are exposing these, you know, deep inner parts of yourself to the world and people can have very different reactions to that. So it can feel very vulnerable, but it's also been, I think the the coolest part has been um, just connecting with people through it and people telling me their reactions or something that resonated with them. Wow. It sounds like this book has been monumental for you in so many ways it's had such an impact but we come to the last question Julia and this one is important so the question is what biscuit has been powering the writing of this book what is your biscuit of choice it's very important to to us on this podcast of course of course so does a biscuit need to be like a sweet treat well if I was choosing a biscuit, it absolutely would be a sweet one. But you have full flexibility to choose what biscuit would be the one you'd go for. So it's fine. I, I do love sweet things. My friend actually brought over last night Levon cookies, which they're these cookies that are from these bakeries, but they're literally like three or four inches tall. Like they're enormous. And there's so many chocolate chips in every single cookie. So I might have to go with that. Now you're talking. That sounds absolutely splendid. Well, if those help produce this book, then I'm I'm all for it. I can't wait to follow you and read more of your books because the writing retreat is absolutely splendid. Julie Bartz, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, another author interview and more book reviews. Next is Paris Requiem by Chris Lloyd, and let me read you the blurb of this one. Paris, September 1940. After three months under Nazi occupation, not much can shock Detective Eddie Giral. That is, until he finds a murder victim who was supposed to be in prison. Eddie knows because he put him there. The dead man is not the first or the last criminal to have been let loose onto the streets. But who is pulling the strings and why? This question will take Eddie from jazz clubs to opera halls, from old flames to new friends. From the lights of Paris to the darkest countryside, pursued by a most troubling you truth, youth, <laughs> pursued by a most troubling youth. Sorry, Chris. Uh, pursued by a most troubling truth. Sometimes to do the right thing, you have to join the wrong side. And let's go to Chris for that first sentence. I'd have been more than happy staying down south. Boniface paused and took a delicate sip from his coffee. But the missus wanted to get back to Paris in time for my three girls to go to school. The other cops in the Bon Asile nodded sagely at Boniface's words, like it was the most natural thing in the world. Through the tobacco-brown cafe window, I saw German jeeps slowly cruise past. Paris was under the Nazis, and Boniface was worried about his kids missing the start of the school term. He wasn't the only one. Nah. What did I think about this book? I absolutely loved it. It had all the components I would want. It had... a a story that just pulls you in. It had the world built round it that I could really believe and really feel part of. Um, The crime and all the mechanisms of that, absolutely superb, really, really good. If you know someone who is into their crime books or into their history books or into both, I think this is a great one to get into. Thoroughly enjoyed. But let's talk to Chris now. Well, it is my absolute pleasure, it really is, to welcome Chris Lloyd to the podcast, whose latest really excellent book is Paris Requiem. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you for asking me. Really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to talking to you because this... Ah, this book has really stayed with me. Okay, let's start with the real basics. Can you give us a summary of this book? Okay, right. Well, Paris Requiem is the second book in the Eddie Giral occupation series. Eddie Giral is a French police detective in Paris under the Nazi occupation. So the first book, The Unwanted Dead, took place in the first 10 days of the occupation when four 
refugees were found murdered in a, in a railway truck. This second book, Paris Requiem, takes place about three months later. It's from September to November 1940. When the Germans first arrived in Paris, they were told to be on their best behaviour. They tried to win hearts and minds. By now, this facade's beginning to crumble. We're seeing the first outbreaks of resistance and we're seeing the first little signs of the fragility and potential brutality of the occupiers. So it's against that backdrop that Eddie, our detective, goes to a crime scene and is surprised to find that the victim of a murder in a jazz club is someone who should have been in prison. Eddie knows he should have been in prison because he's the one who put him there in the first place. So Eddie decides to investigate further into what's happening and he discovers that a series of French prisoners are going missing from a prison in Paris and he doesn't know what's happening. Are they being disappeared by the Gestapo? Is it some sort of ploy by the free French to get men out of prison to fight for the French? He doesn't know. So he decides to investigate. And that investigation brings him up against the very, very powerful gangs in Paris at this time, which only became more powerful under the Nazis. And it also brings him up against the, the occupying authorities as he, as he tries to find out who's pulling the strings, what in fact is going on here. And it's at the same time he's approached by, an, an, well, it's an old flame, but it's an old flame that never quite ignited. And she comes to him to ask him to look for her son. Her son is a soldier in a Senegalese regiment in the French army who she's been told he's a prisoner of war, but she can't find where he is. She, she can't find out anything about him. So she asks Eddie to help. And Eddie is a bit reluctant at first, but he does help. And that brings him up against another side of the occupying authorities. So he's, he's taking on the German authorities on, on several fronts at once. And basically the story is that, what, what Eddie turns up in these investigations. Both those two strands, the, the missing prisoners and the Senegalese soldiers, are, are based on real events. So there were real events that actually inspired those, those two storylines. And so presumably you've had to do some research. You haven't just heard a little bit about it and then made it up <laughs> totally... <laughs> <laughs> is history your, your thing? Yeah, as an amateur. I mean, I'm not a historian. I, I studied languages, which is what took me to, to Spain and to, to France and to, to live in various places. So um, it, languages was my thing. But no, history is my amateur thing. Absolutely fascinated. It always fascinated me. And when, when I did my degree, I did my degree in Spanish and French, and I, I did the thesis on the French resistance in the vehicle, which is one which which really what first got me into it and discovering one of the things that stayed with me always were the factions in the resistance i thought it was all they were all just one great big body who who fought against the germans well there was terrible infighting you had the gaullists and the communists okay but then within the gaullists and the communists they all hated each other and there were various groups who just didn't work together to get on and i think it was that that interested me but but yeah the research the research is just way too fascinating it it, it takes me down every rabbit hole imaginable in the end, it gets to the point where I have to be strong with myself and say, right, that's it. You stop researching, you start writing the book. But then that, that doesn't really work either, because it's not until you start writing the book that you discover what it is you need to know. So I do, I do a sort of very general background research on, on what's going on in the war in general, what's going on in France narrow it down to the time period. So as I say, this is September to November. So I look through every I look through archives, look through people's diaries, look through the, the, the general history of what was going on at that time. And I have a theme in mind that I want, but the, it's that research that often gives me the story. Like the first strand, the missing prisoners, I didn't know anything about until I started researching. And it was discovering that that sent me off on that path. Whereas the Senegalese soldiers, yes, I had some idea, I knew something, but obviously the research taught me everything I didn't know. And so, you know, which, which was a lot. So, so yeah, the, the research, I, I, th I think you'll probably find this, you must talk to a lot of historical fiction authors, the research is, is the, it's the, the benefit and the drawback of being a historical writer because the research is so fascinating. There's so much, it gives you, it gives you so much, it gives you the, the stories, it also gives you tiny little vignettes, but it can swallow you up. And, and sort of, I mean, I spent a whole day trying to find out what colour the ration tickets were for bread in Paris in October 1940. Yeah. 
And in the end, I couldn't find it, but I found other interesting things which helped. But but it's that, yeah, the, the research takes up a huge amount of time, but it's, you have to know when to stop and then sit down and start writing. And then you discover, oh, I don't know that. And I want to say this in the story. And that's when you do the really targeted research. In this book, Eddie's rattled and go. he wanted to go and have a whiskey in a cafe. And I sort of wrote the scene and then thought, well, actually, would he be allowed to? And then you research it and discover, well, no, he wouldn't actually, because that takes place in September. And the previous month, the Vichy government had banned the sale of alcohol over 16% proof. So so you, you, you often don't know what you need to know until you start writing your story. Yes, and yet the book, I didn't feel like I was being sort of preached at, like I was having a history lesson. I was just caught up in the story and carried along with it and the setting. So it, it must be quite hard, though, when the research is so interesting to still breathe life into the story, which you did so well. Well, thank you. But I, I think one of the things, one of the first things you have to learn and the first areas you, I made mistakes is knowing what to leave out. I mean, I've I've written like the first book, I wrote a first draft, which was probably twice as long because it was, had all these historical facts in. And you should have then come back to read it to do your second draft and realise, well, they're superfluous. They don't advance the story. And you do have to then be sort of quite strict and decide, well, what of the research helps me tell my story? I'm not writing a, a non-fiction book. I'm not writing a history book. I'm writing mm -hmm. a book that uses history, and I try to use it as truthfully and honestly as possible, but I'm writing a history book to tell a story. So you have to learn quite quickly what bits of the research, what bits of the history to cut, what not to put in. And, and as I was writing this third book, there was so much going on at that time I, 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 I reckon I could probably have written three or four parallel books with everything that was going on in that period, but I couldn't. And of course, I couldn't use all the things that I found. And, it, and you sort of, it, it's, it's like you have to let go. And it's quite difficult at times. You sort of think, well, I love that, but it just doesn't fit into this story. I can't use it. And so, so yeah, you, you, it's, I think that one of the big secrets is knowing what to leave out. And when I was reading it, I wasn't even aware um, in my stupidity that you had the, a first book out, that it was actually part of a series. It didn't it didn't feel like a series. I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything, that I hadn't read the first. Oh, right. Yeah, no, the, well, the, yeah, the first, I was one of those people who managed to bring a first book out in the lockdown. So it, it sort of, yeah, it, it, it um, a lot of people, you know, didn't realise that there was a first book in the series. But it's quite nice. I mean, sort of people, I mean, finding a lot of people who are saying they've read the second book, now they're going to go back to the first book. Eddie, I mean, I plan to write throughout the whole of the, the occupation of Paris, and Eddie's story is going to reflect the history of the occupation. So as the occupation becomes tougher and more brutal, then Eddie faces harder decisions. But... Within that, so that there is an, a sort of a character art for Eddie and, and his life. But within that, like the idea is that each book should be a standalone, that everything is resolved within that book. I mean, there are, there are sort of things that carry on over books and characters, obviously. But, but the actual story of each book has to be resolved within each book. I don't want to leave cliffhangers for, for other books. I, I, I'm just not happy with that idea. So, so yeah... So, so, so that is the idea that that it should be able to be read as a standalone. Because again, I mean, I, I I know from myself when I've discovered new authors, I'm sometimes reading an author a, a first book for me, but it's the author's sixth book in a series, and so you need to be able to 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 step in at any point. Yes, quite because I don't want to have to go back and start at book one if you know if I've got book two or three I just want to get into it there and then and and then as you say I can always go back and catch up exactly yeah then you sort of then you sort of and that's quite nice as well I've done that with other series and then you get to think oh so that's why he's like that in book three or or whatever yeah yeah, yeah that's actually a fun thing to do I think and I'm interested when you're writing a book based at that time, when it's actually the time to write, do you have to sort of get yourself in the frame of mind? Do you have to play music of that time or, I don't know, drink your tea with a with a cup and saucer or <laughs> blackout blinds? You know, what are you doing to get in the zone? It's, it's exactly your first one, music. I put music on. And for for, for each book... I've had a specific piece of music that, that sums up that book for me. So, so, so this Paris Requiem 
is um, Jat André, which was uh, it, it's kind of like the, it was it was it was odd because it, it, there's a version in both French and German, and it was like the French equivalent of "We'll Meet Again." Oh wow! Uh, it was that sort of song in the war. There were lyrics in French, lyrics in German. Um, and it's this, I will wait for you and I will wait for you when you come home from war type thing. But but the version that Eddie likes and that I listen to to get myself there in the zone is uh, an instrumental, a jazz version from that time, from 1940 it was recorded, by um, Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli. So it's just guitar and violin. And so, so yes, I use music. And I often do put on... Um, old um, newsreel of the period. I sometimes put on a bit of newsreel from the period, listen to some music, and that tends to get me into the into, into where I want to be to be able to write. Um, one of the things, again, going back to the research, one of the things I do do a lot, which I find incredibly helpful, is, is this sort of like immersive research almost, as you say, it's... it's 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 listen to the music. I watch old films. I sort of bought postcards at the Bucaniste in Paris. You know the 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 the, the book stands yeah. on the side of the Seine. Postcards from the thirties to sort of just look to see how people dressed, how they walked, what and and watch old films from French films from that era to see how they sounded. Uh, listen to music that they listened to. Read the books that Eddie would have read. In it, and it's yeah that that's a really good it's it's a very good it's sort of like a background hum of um of research that, that that gets me into that into that time and does eddie stay with you when you're not writing yeah he does a bit especially when i'm going out for a walk going out for a walk is just brilliant for solving problems and solving what happens next and i walk along and it's it, it, it's odd when when i when i plan the book when I plan a story, I, I don't plan a huge amount. I just plan sort of to the next key scene. And then I write it. And that, that gives me the idea for what happens after that. But when I do that, I sort of see it almost like I'm watching a film, but from above, from a sort of a, an, an oblique angle above. And I see Eddie there. When I sit down to write, I don't see him because I see through his eyes. I'm experiencing what he's experiencing. When I'm not writing, I often play out scenes in my head as I'm walking along. And I'm sort of probably looking sort of quite vague as I'm walking along along the cliff tops near where I live. And I'm sort of thinking, oh, right, how does this work? How does that work? And, I, and I'm, I'm trying to work it out. But then also I, I, I do do things like I go in when I go, if I go and buy bread, I imagine if Eddie were in the shop with me, how he'd interact with the person behind the counter and with the other people in the, the bread shop. So, yeah, he... Again, because the book's written in first person. So it's a bit like method acting, I suppose. Eddie gets inside my head and I, I'm, I'm, while I'm writing, I try and keep him there as much as possible. Let's just talk about the combination of history and crime because I love it so much. But with your emphasis on history, you could have used different genres. It didn't have to be crime. Are you a crime fan? Is that something that you wanted to include, particularly as you unravel these different stories that took play? Yeah, I am. I think I, I, so I'm, I became a crime fiction fan before I became a historical fiction fan. And so I've, all, I've always seen it through the eyes of crime fiction. It's, it's, it's an odd thing when you write historical crime fiction because it's, where are you? Are you a historical fiction writer or a crime fiction writer? And you, you, there, there comes a point where you have to marry the two together but I, but I think historical fiction and crime fiction do do that well. I mean, I'm historical fiction. I write historical fiction. So I'm not writing a non-fiction history. If you're a historian writing history, you're sort of talking about things that happened. I think when you write historical fiction, you're talking about an emotional response to things that happened. And I think that's what modern day crime fiction is as well. It's, rather, it's not so much the whodunit anymore mm. as an emotional response to what happened, the fallout, the build-up, the, the effect it has on people's lives. And I think, especially writing about a time like I write, about the occupation, um, it marries well, it, it goes well with crime fiction, especially because... One of the whole reasons was I wanted to, to explore what it was like for someone living under that system, but someone who was, in fact, forced into almost collaborating with, with the Nazis. You know, Eddie is a police officer. He's, he's at their beck and call. He has to do certain things at their, 
at their orders, but then he tries to do things that are not at their orders. And so he's trying to solve crimes and sort of crimes within a city when far greater crimes are, uh, and far worse things are happening outside Paris, in, in Europe in general. And so it, it's, I, I think it's that, that quite nice juxtaposition between sort of how Eddie keeps his head focused on seeing justice done in the way he'd like to see it done when sort of justice has become a, a forgotten concept. And we need to mention your awards because you are the winner of the HWA Gold Crown Award for Best Historical Fiction and you've been shortlisted for the CWA Historical Dagger Award. Well done. I mean, it just shows. It's not just me thinking these books are great. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. Yeah, no, it was, it was absolutely lovely. I really wasn't expecting it. As I said, the book, the, that, this was for the first book. It came out in lockdown. And there, there's, you know, and a lot of people were sort of quite unlucky that really good books that came out in lockdown ne were never given the chance they deserved. And then sort of, I was sort of worried that was going to happen. And then suddenly I was shortlisted for a couple of prizes. And the, then, the, yeah, as I say, it, as you said, it, it won the, the Historical Writers Association. It won the Gold Crown, which was just a wonderful thing. I didn't believe it at first. I, I, I just... I, I just couldn't believe it. I, when, when, I, when I saw it being shortlisted, I refreshed my computer screen because I thought, oh, that must be a mistake, and realised, no, I had actually been shortlisted. <laughs> and, then, and then it won, and it was just... It's an extraordinary feeling. It was a wonderful feeling. But, I mean, if, if, if you already have sort of imposter syndrome, it sort of... It, it went from a great high to, 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 think, to worrying, they're going to want it back. They made a mistake. It wasn't me they meant. But then suddenly realised, no, it was me. And they think, OK... You've now got to really pick your game up. You've really got because you know they've made, they've they've awarded you this. It's a tremendous honour, and, I, and I, I feel very humbled at being presented it with it. But you sort of think, okay, this now means that you've really got to make sure you live up to this. You know, you've got to be better still. It's but which is which is a nice thing to to have. Yes, it's a pressure. But yeah, it was it was it was a wonderful feeling. I, I have to be honest. It really did feel lovely, and and your peers awarding you. Know, judging that, that that you deserve this this honor was 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 wonderful well we come to the last question chris and this is a very important one so prepare yourself <laughs> please we'll ask all authors this question what is your biscuit of choice what biscuit powered the writing of paris requiem oh biscuit you're right that is the one question that matters <laughs> <laughs> um let me think i would have to say i would have to say that it's now, this is going to sound quite odd. I would have to say that it's the milk chocolate hobnob, but kept in the freezer and eaten straight from the freezer. It gives it a completely different texture. It's amazing. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to run from our conversation and immediately throw <laughs> the hobnobs in, into the freezer. I do like chocolate from the fridge, yeah, but I, I have do. never considered a move to the freezer for a biscuit, Chris. Well, I didn't. It's, it was just that my my parents used to keep biscuits in the freezer. I never really understood why. And I thought, why on earth do you do that? And then I tried one. I tried a chocolate hobnob straight from the freezer, and it was gorgeous. And when you dunk it, there's a completely different texture to do it. It doesn't it doesn't fall to pieces for one thing, but when you dunk it in your tea, there's a completely different feel to it and taste. It 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 sharpens the taste. It's wonderful. Really recommend it. When I woke up this morning, I didn't know my world was going to be changed forevermore. <laughs> but here we are. This is fascinating. Well, I hope you enjoy it. Please, I do hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I will. And I hope everyone enjoys reading Paris Requiem. Chris Lloyd, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Philippa. Fabulous. Now, before we go on to anything else, I can tell you that I have tried the frozen hobnob option that Chris told us about. And it is a game changer. First of all, it doesn't actually freeze the biscuits. It's really odd. But secondly, they taste delicious. So thank you so much for that, Chris. But before we go on any more, we've got the wonderful listener, Johan, to tell us about a book she would recommend to us. Hello, Philippa and all the podcast listeners. This is Johan from Edinburgh. I would like to recommend the audio book, You Let Me In by Lucy Clark. It's really easy to understand as there's only the one narrator and it's got just that right sense of chill to make you feel a little bit spooked and look behind you but not to stop you sleeping. 
Hope you all enjoy it. We do choose to listen. Bye. Well, thank you so much, Johan. That sounds very intriguing. In fact, I've just ordered that book now on your recommendation. It does sound really good. So Johan was recommending the book called You Let Me In by Lucy Clark. And that's actually published oh, a couple of years ago, 2018 for the hardback, 2019 for the paperback. So it's been out a while as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Johan. Oh, and do call back and tell us your biscuit of choice because we do like to hear that. If you're wondering how you can call into the show, there will be a link in the show notes. You just go to our website, speakpipe.com forward slash QBR. Right, let's move on to the next book. And this is Mad Honey by Jodie Pico and Jennifer Finney Boylan. Let me read you the blurb. Olivia fled her abusive marriage to return to her hometown and take over the family beekeeping business when her son Asher was six. Now, impossibly, her baby is six feet tall and in his last year of high school, a kind, good-looking, popular ice hockey star with a tiny sprite of a new girlfriend. Lily also knows what it feels like to start over. When she and her mother relocated to New Hampshire, it was all about a fresh start. She and Asha couldn't help falling for each other and Lily feels happy for the first time, but can she trust him completely? Then Olivia gets a phone call. Lily is dead and Asha is arrested on a charge of murder. As the case against him unfolds, she realises he has hidden more than he's shared with her and Olivia knows firsthand that the secrets we keep reflect the past we want to leave behind and that we rarely know the people we love as well as we think we do. Let's do first sentence before I tell you what I think. Olivia, December 7, 2018, the day of. From the moment I knew I was having a baby, I wanted it to be a girl. I wandered the aisles of department stores touching doll-sized dresses and tiny sequined shoes. I pictured us with matching nail polish, me who'd never had a manicure in my life. I imagined the day her fairy hair was long enough to capture in pigtails, her nose pressed to the glass of a school bus window. I saw her first crush, prom dress, heartbreak. Each vision was a bead on a rosary of future memories. I prayed daily. So, this book, I mean, I love Jodie's books, and but let's just say I love this one. It is what I would describe as old school Jodie. Yes, obviously, it's written by Jennifer Finney Boylan as well, uh, but it's very slow to build. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. It's a great story. But then it just sort of hits you with these revelations as you go along. It's a absolutely brilliant book I thought very good I learnt and retained more about bees in this book than I did in the book I reviewed was it only last week the bees by Lean Paul this one was really really good it's got a story that grabs you Um, I found the court case very interesting the characters it's a beautiful book bravo 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 and I did hear some of it narrated and the audiobook was really good as well if that's your preference so there we go that's Mad Honey next one The Red Notebook by Antoine Lorraine now this is a short book 160 pages listen to this bookseller Laurent Letelier comes across an abandoned handbag on a Parisian street and feels impelled to return it to its owner the bag contains no phone all contact information, but a small red notebook with handwritten thoughts and jottings reveals a person that Laurent would very much like to meet. Without even a name to go on, how is he to find one woman in a city of millions? OK, let's do it. And um, I should say this is translation. Uh, it's obviously translated from the French by Emily Boyce and Jane Atkin. So if you're doing a theme on reading translated books then this could be one for you. Anyway, first sentence. The taxi had dropped her on the corner of the boulevard. She was barely 50 metres from home. The road was lit by street lamps, which gave the buildings an orange glow. But even so, she was anxious, as she always was when she returned late at night. She looked behind her, but she saw nobody. I loved this book so much. I haven't read any more books from this author. Apparently there's one called The President's Hat that's really well rated. I want to read it immediately. I didn't feel... I enjoyed the the pace of a short book, novella if we're going to call it that, 
but the story wasn't simplified. So I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. I just thought I was gaining. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. It was a very nice, quite a simple story, but lots of layers to not really, really good. I want to get the president's hat and read that as well. So that was The Red Notebook by Antoine Lorraine. Very good too. And that one's been out a while because it was on my bookshelf saying, Philippa, read me. So I did. I read it. Anyway, let's get on to the final book, Her Sweet Revenge by Sarah Bonner. Let's read the blurb on this one. Helena is beautiful, successful and living in married bliss in Exeter, but she's hiding a secret that could tear her perfect life apart. When the notes begin to arrive, she realises someone else must know her secret. But what might her husband and his overbearing family do if they find out the truth? Thea is reeling from her best friend Helena's death. But when she starts digging into the circumstances, she receives a threatening note warning her to stop. She knows her friend's death wasn't an accident. This was murder. And she's determined to get revenge. Let's do first sentence. Chapter one, 2018, Helena. My mother-in-law is already holding court in the dining room when I arrive to meet her for lunch. Just like every other Tuesday, regardless of anything else I might have going on, God forbid if I were ever to miss the bi-weekly torture session Geraldine subjects me to. Uh, I thought this was great. If you're looking for a um, psychological thriller and uh, sort of a twisty one and these notes and who are they and just trying to work it out, who did what, yes, you will enjoy it. So that was the last book this week, her perfect, her perfect revenge. You see, I'm now changing the name of your book, Sarah. I do apologise. Her Sweet Revenge by Sarah Bonner. Let us just do a quick recap on the books I've mentioned this week. So we've had The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz and Julia very kindly joined us to tell us all about that book. Then we've had uh, Paris Requiem by Chris Lloyd and Chris very kindly came on to talk to us about that book. I've also reviewed Mad Honey by Jodie Pickle and Jennifer Finney Boylan, um, The Red Notebook by Antoine Lorraine and Her Sweet Revenge by Sarah Bonner. I've probably mispronounced 99% of the names and words in this week's episode but the fact I've made it through without coughing too much is a miracle. I'm going off now to cough a lot and read books so I hope you're okay. I hope you're doing well and can't wait to talk to you again next week so just look after yourselves and I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books. Said no one. Ever. See you again soon.